الحمد لله لا يعبد حقا إلا الله وما بكم من نعمة فمن الله لا مانع لما أعطى ولا معطي لما منع ألا له الحكم تبارك الله سبحانه خلق آدم بيده وسواه وأمره ونهى ثم جتباه وتاب عليه واصطفاه أرد إبليس فأصمه وأبعده وأشقاه وفي قصته نذير لمن خالف الله وعصاه أشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله نبي صدق هدت أنوار شرعته بعد العمل الهدى من كان عميتا أحيا به الله قوما قام سعدهم كما أحيا به قوما أماريتا ما ضل وما غوى وما ينطق عن الهوى إنه إلا وحي يوحى سبقت به البشرى ونزل عليه سبحان الذي أسرى ساد الورى بلا امترى حين افترى عظم الورى فهو المجلي والورى إلى ورى صلى عليه الله ما وبل هما وما نجوم لألأت وجه السماء أما بعد Being here tonight and gathering in this blessed place Al-Ansar hoping and pray that a day will come all of us will be convened with Al-Muhajirin and Al-Ansar in Jannat Al-Firdaus Rabbi Faktubha Lana The organization gave me Surah Al-Asr to explain Do you know what chapter is Surah Al-Asr in Quran? What chapter is that? It's chapter what? It's chapter 30. Who said chapter 30? You did? MashaAllah, that's good. Allah bless you. You smart boy. Alhamdulillah, smart boy. Chapter 30. May Allah bless you, but that's wrong. <laughs> One. Surah Al Asr. 96. Allahu Akbar. That's a good answer, even though it's wrong. Huh? 93. Allahu Akbar. I love your boys. You're smart, kicking it, but that's wrong too. Huh? Huh? 103. That's smart boy. You'll get it right. Allahu Akbar. That was right. What do you have in mind? Well, you have 109. Oh, subhanallah. He got it. Okay? That's one or what? 103. That's Surah Al Asr. And all the scholars at, um, agreed that Surah Al Asr consists of how many ayat? Three ayat. Only three verses. And I believe that all of you are sitting in front of me and all our brothers and sisters here tonight that you have Surah Al Asr already memorized. But tonight we would like to gain all the blessings and all the lessons. As much as possible from Surah Al Asr. And the young boys, we're going to get some benefits out of Surah Al Asr. And all the honey master in it, we're going to extract it. And all the, you know, um, sweet and sour, we're going to get it out. And all the sweetness that Surah Al Asr has, we're bringing it out tonight. And all the barbecue sauce that the Surah is blessed with is coming out today. And you're going to taste it sweeter than even anjara that y'all eat as breakfast. And you're going to even taste it better than the bananas. Since we're sitting here and we have Somalis, I heard even Somalis, before they breathe, they have to eat bananas. <laughs> you see? So we're going to get all the blessings from that one, from Surah al -Asr. Okay, Khalid, you ready for it? Inshallah. So this is what we have tonight. Muhammad. Okay? Inshallah, Surah Al Asr 103 consists of what? How many ayat? Three ayat. Only three. Wal Asri, Inna al Insana la fi khusr, Illa al Ladina Amanu wa Amilu al Salihati wa Tawasaw bil Haqi wa Tawasaw bil Sabr. That's the ayat of Surah Al Asr. Now, when Almighty opened the chapter, he said, Wal Asr. In Arabic language, if you want to swear, we have three letters that are used for swearing. Well is one of them. You say, Wallahi, by using the letter well. Or 
you use the letter ba, you say billahi, I swear by Allah. Or you use the um, the letter ta, you say what? Tallahi. So these are the what? Huruful qasami fi lughati al-arabiyyati lada al-arabi qatiba. You say wallahi, billahi, tallahi, swearing by Allah. Except ta is never used with any name out of the 99 names of Allah, except ta, except Allah. So you cannot use ta and attach it to Allah's name to swear except lafdul jalala Allah. You cannot say tal rahmani or tal maliki is against the rule. So we only say tallahi. Tallahi is what we what? We used. When we swear by Allah, attaching to Lafdul Jalala. Wallahi la akidanna asnamakum ba'da an tuwallu e mudbirin. Wallahi is another word, harf of qasm. And always in Arabic language, before you swear, you have to make sure that you only swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Swearing by other than Allah is kufurun, ba kufurun bawah. It's disbelief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The only one who has the permissibility and the right to swear by whatever he wants and nobody can question him because he has the ultimate authority is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah can swear by whatever he wants. But us, we only swear by him. He can swear by whatever he wants because he is the creator of everything. Are we the creator of everything? So that means we cannot what? Swear except by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when Allah swears, is he, uh, uh, can he swear by whatever he wants or he can? Huh? Can he or he can? Why? Because he is the khalaq al-alim, the creator of everything. And that's why he, in Quran, he sweared by al-buruj. Was-sama'i dhati al-buruj. And also he sweared by al-tariq. Was-sama'i wa-tariq. He sweared by the sun. Was-shamsi. Waduhaha, he swear by the night, Wallayli, Ida Yakshaha, he also swear by Wallayl itself. And then he also swear by the time of Duha, Waduha, Wallayli, Ida, Ida Saja. And here he swear in by Al Asr. So he said, Wal Asri. And always when you swear, you have to make sure that you have three things in mind. The first is what you swear by. The second, is the reason of your swearing. And the third is the answer of your swearing. If your father said, you know what? Mus'ab al-asghar. Mus'ab wallahi. And then your dad looked at you like this. And then he swore again, wallahi. And he's not talking. You're going to say, what's up with pop? What's going on with daddy? Like dad is just swearing, nothing is coming. Because when a person swears, what do you expect? What do you expect, Yusuf? To what? Exactly, to have something to what? To say. Right, Abdul Rahman? When a person swears, you have to make sure that you what? You have something to say. Now, if a person swears, I swear by Allah that I will give you this if you come to me. So I will give you this is the reason for his what? Swearing. So when Allah swears by Al-Asr, what is the reason for his swearing is the next what? The next verse. Inna al-insana lafi khusr. So in Arabic, we have harful qasam. The letter or whatever you use to swear, that letter is called harful qasam. And what you swear by is muqusimun bihi. What you use to swear. And what you swear upon is called muqusimun alayhi. How many um, terminologies did I give? How many? You know the reason why I'm focusing on you? Because y'all got no bills to pay. If I ask your parents right now, they will give me all the bills that they have to pay right now. See? So, but you, y'all can grab it. And that's why they brought you here. Okay? So, muqusimun bihi is what you what used to swear. And the purpose of your swearing that you land on, that's muqusimun eh? So these are the three things that I named. Okay. Wal Asr. Allah's word by Al Asr. What is the meaning of Al Asr? The opinions of scholars had been what? Divided into five. 
as of what Almighty Allah meant by the word al -Asr. How many? Five. Out of all the five things that scholars mention, one is the best. Only one. And that is Time itself is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is swearing by. Some scholars said he's swearing by a specific time. Some scholars said that he's, he's swearing by a time that each generation lived in. And some said he's swearing by the time of Al-Asr. And some scholars said he's talking about the Salat Al-Asr itself. That's number four. And others said, no, that's a dahr itself, the time in general. Because nothing had taken place since Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala had created the heavens and earth except it's within time. It will never go out of it. And whatever you and I will do will fall in what? In time. So the best commodity that we possess is time. And as a person, the what makes you rich is the time that you have. If somebody else has control over your time and he the boss and you have to respond to him on his time, whenever he is ready, you're losing the bigger portion of your life. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us of the importance of time. Wal asr by the time. And nobody will come to this world except in a well-defined Time. And nobody will leave the world except in a well-determined time. And nobody will gain something except in its own time. And none will lose something except in its own time. And nobody will be able to ascend or nobody will be able to promote or to demote except in what? In time. So nothing will take place except in time. That's why when you tell people we have something to do, they ask you what time? Because of the importance of what? So Allah swore by this time. He did swear by Al-Asr. Wal Asr. Now whatever you will gain in Al-Asr in time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said it's all in what? All in vain. Whatever you will obtain, whatever you will gain, whatever you will get in your time, all will be in what? In vain. So your wealth is nothing but what? But vain. Your wealth, your children, whatever you get, it's going to add to your loss except that which you use to please the one who had given you that time. So your wealth it's nothing but khasara unto you if you do not use it on a time that that Almighty Subhanahu Wa Taala wanted you to use. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala said, "All mankind are in loss. Everybody, without even exception, everybody is in great loss." Inna al insana lafi khusr. Now the word al insan has alif and lam attached to it, and in Arabic language. Alif and lamb that is used in insan here is called lil istigraq. What's the word again in Arabic? Lili. And Abdul Rahman, he pulling in like see, but why he jash away, he nafta away, he khal away, and all the way he together. That's good, Abdul Rahman. You the man. See, Musab laughing. See. So this what? Lili. Lil istigraq. Al-Layth was Zuhri, you owe Sufyan, it's called for what? Istighraq. You get that? It's for what? Istighraq. So this, the word istighraq, it means it's plunging to in, embody everybody, everyone. So there's not human being that is, you know, serving as exception. And no one is out of this statement Everybody's included. That's when they say it's what? It's the rock. Everybody's included. So in al insan al verily mankind or a man in general is in what? A loss, except he or she that uses that time to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by acting righteously. Illa Ladina Amanu wa amilu 
الصالحات except those who believe in Allah so see whatever a person will get give a person the whole world Y'all know the, the founder of Facebook? Yeah. Who the founder of Facebook? Don't be giving me faces and acting like some pie, some taco news. Y'all all know what I'm talking about. Because your dad's sitting here, y'all acting like y'all don't know. Be straight up with me, boys. Who the founder of Facebook? Mark Zuckerberg, right? You know his net worth? How much? 40 billion? I'll kill you like three years back. Laith, you have any idea? His his wealth, the net worth of um, Mark. Huh. Okay. Uh, the Shabab al Huh? 78 billion. He's almost close. So he's now 73.3 billion. Young boy, only 33. Huh? But all what he got Unless he has Iman in it, it's in what? It's khasara, as Quran says. So whatever a person possesses, like let's see, see this young boy, the box, the, the, you know, the welterweight, main weather, in all the, the, and the weathers that he's living in, and all the millions he got, ain't nothing. A wealth or fortune without faith is nothing. If you even you possess the world, أين الأكابرة الأكاسرة الأولى جمع الكنوز فما بقينا وما بقوا. Why those who compiled the world and ruled the world and those who had governed the world through their own power, where are they? They are gone. So insan is in great loss. Human being is in great loss, except if he or she uses that wealth in serving Allah. All acting righteously for the pleasure of Allah, and also we collaborate to come together and advise one another based on Al Haq, the truth. Who is Al Haq? Allah. We come together in serving who? Allah. Come together in obeying who? Come together in order to please who? Allah. That's Al Haq because Allah is Al Haq, and one of His names is Al Al Haq, Subhanahu Tabaraka wa Taala. Those who believe in Allah. Now, if you get wealth and you billionaire or you trillionaire or you zillionaire and whatever ear ear that people got at the end of their titles, if you get the whole world and you have taqwa attached to it, you're the best. If you get wealth, you know, from eating peanut butter and, you know, from eating peanut butter jelly to counting Benjamelis, and you get taqwa along with it, you're good. But if you've been eating all what you want, you get the best cars, you get, you know, S550 of 2020, you get double R Range Rover, you get Lamborghini, you get Maserati, you get Ferraris and jumping and tiring it all around, and you get no taqwa, you are, you are a loser. You get that, boy? So don't be kicking out and be shoveling like you popcorn in your in, in your mouth and be watching TV. Man, those boys, they they rich, man. I wish when I grow up, I'd be like them and get all that and they get no taqwa. You'd be like them without taqwa, you're a loser. So what makes you to be the best? It's what? But if you get taqwa and you get Benjamin's along with it, is that good or not? It's good. You get with extra, extra, and, and your account, Wells Fargo account is pounding with taqwa. That's better than going negative in a Bank of America with taqwa. Right? Right? Except those who believe in Allah and act what? Righteously. Actually, I get me like maybe the 750 BMW, be my wife as they call it. Or get me like those 2020, you know, Mercedes, and I get taqwa, I'm keeping my iman tight. That means I'm upon it, and Almighty is pleased with me. But whatever I get in the world, if I get no taqwa, it's nothing. They enjoy one another, advise one another, collaborate, come together based on what? Haq, truth. And also they advise one another to have what? 
patience because in our lives, some of us will be fitna for others. وَجَعَلْنَا بَعْضَكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ فِتْنَةً أَتَصْبِرُونَ وَكَانَ رَبُّكَ بَصِيرًا Some of us will be fitna in no community without problems. No communities in the world without what? Do we have this community? Is there any community without issues? The community that never, you know, gone through turmoils. If there's any community that went through successfully without issues, that would have been the community that Prophet Sallallahu built. But even among them, they have their own what? Differences. But because they kept their mind straight and the purpose was to serve Allah and his messenger and to advise one another, they were able to overcome the differences and they build a nation. See? That's how they built the nation. And the nation of Islam grew from that. I'm not talking about the one in Chicago. I'm talking about Muslims all together. <laughs> See? Came together. One single ummah, one nation, one single what? Ibadah. One be behind one single leader. And with this, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi shaped his own community. Because they built it based on what? Al-Haqq. And based on what? At-Tawasi bil-Sabr. So Muslims here... In San Diego, we would like to share with you some facts so that we can incorporate if the X generations will forget it and the baby boomers will forget it, at least you, the young ones, we want you to change the dynamics of Muslims here in America. But you start where you from, start right here in San Diego. Because Maradona Diego is already old. He does not have the move anymore. You all get the move. Came here eight years ago. Some of you were sitting wearing diapers. Some of you sitting in front of you were wearing diapers when I came here eight years back. But see, now you're grown. To come back eight years from now, you're going to be all what? Grown. From here, from now, the responsibility in your what? In your heart. There are two young companions, Mu'adh and Mu'awwad. Is their names again? Mu'adh and? Mu'adh and Mu'awwad. Do you know Mu'adh and Mu'awwad, they were young. In the battlefield, they went to Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, you know what? We heard that there's a man called Abu Jahl. He's disturbing you. We want to take care of him. Can you believe this? Like young boys. They said, Prophet, we heard this. This guy is troublemaker. See? He acted like, like the uh, chap of his, his own time. Just, just acting up, prophet, let's take care of him. He said, you too young. They said, no, because we love this deen and he's trying to corrupt it. See, from young age, see what Napoleon did, they did it already. Talking about he want to be the emperor of the whole world at the age of 14. But by the time he turned 19, he took care of leadership and power, even though you used to drink and all that and messed up. But he had the what the vision and the mission, and he was able to what to achieve. Some of you sitting here, fourteen, or soon you will be fourteen. Late how old? See, when Prophet Sallallahu passed away, Abdullah ibn Abbas was in the same age. Same, Abdullah ibn Abbas late. He was just your age when Prophet passed away. But guess what? In no tafsir in the world, except they quote tafsir and they quote Imam Abdullah ibn Abbas. He, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not pass away. Hatta jama Abnu Abbas al-Mufassal kulla. Ibn Abbas, he gathered Mufassal. You know what Mufassal is? Mufassal is from Surah Al-Hujurat all the way to Birabbi Nas. From chapter 49 to chapter 114, before Prophet passed away at the age of 12, he already memorized and he captured everything in his heart. He knew the meaning and the interpretation of everything. And he was only what? He was only 13. And he became one. Not even. All the companions agreed upon that when it comes to the interpretation of Quran, he like here on the top. And he was only what? 13. Check this out, ladies. See? He was only 13. But he was here. So don't be sitting playing, you know, playing the, the, the angry bird 
and trying to be like Batman or Superman or Yet Man or whatever man that they're creating, and Ant Man, even now they have Ant Man. How can Ant be man? And when your father is not looking, you just go and put some mask on and try to do this, trying to be like Spider-Man. If you do this on top of the building, I, you going down. <laughs> By fact, we're going to pray Janazah on you, take you to Barzakh. That's all fake, boys. It's all what? It's all fake. You think when he, when he does this and then he's going like on top of the building, that's only Sony camera and he touching Panasonic hooking it up. It's not real. You try it, you go in Barzakh. So that's not real. And they're not the real, the real men. The real men, the young boys with vision. That tomorrow, this is what I want to do. If Mark was able to revolutionize the world through his own Facebook or facade book, as a Muslim, I got something better to offer. For my own self, for my own community, for my own society, for my own nation, and for the world. Don't think you're too young for that. Don't think you what? Too young for that. No, you're not. There's a man known as Abu Ali al Rayahi, one of the toppest imams in the world altogether. Do you know he was, when he teaches and gives talk like this, do you know who's sitting in front of him? Abu Hanifa, Laith, and Awzai. Those are like the heavy weights of knowledge. They used to be in front of Abu, Abu Ali and he was young. So you just have to make sure that you what? You determine what you want for your future and to make sure that you get something better. For whatever that you're seeing, people having, media days, TV days and all, that's all fake. Huh? It's all short living. So see how people came together, put their resources together, and built communities in order for them to serve al-haq and also advise one another to achieve what? Patience. And sometimes everybody cannot be on the same level. Brothers here, and the brothers all the way in the back, and the sisters here, and the young boys right in front of me, everybody cannot be on the same level. Everybody with whatever Allah what? And the grand same ways. Everybody gets something special. All of us, not the same level. So don't look at him like, man, he get this one. I don't get it. No, you have something in you. But because you did not identify it, that's why you're looking at him this way. They say, they, they, they're the liberty of the world. And they're popular and all that. Ain't nobody popular. You make people popular. So you by yourself, you can also what achieve it. Let me tell you this. There was a man known as Qutuz. Qutuz was a slave. He was a slave sold to slavery. But do you know what happened in his life? He promised that the Muslim Ummah is suffering. The Muslim Ummah is what? Suffering. That's like eight, nine hundred years ago. He said, if Muslim leaders can do it, I ask Almighty to free me from slavery so that I can serve the deen. Look at this. He's slave to somebody. And he make him prayer. And he make him dua. Oh God, Almighty, I ask you. I see Muslims, they messed up all around the world. And the leaders, they don't even care about the faith. That's like 600, like 800 years ago. So, oh Allah, free me from this slavery so that I can serve the deen. He started making his plans, making his dua. Do you know what happened? You heard of Mongols, right? The Tatar. Jenkins Khan and Holako, his grandson, they wiped Muslims from the face of this earth. And killed Muslims. And killed, you know, those who were not upon what they were upon. And they captured all the Muslim leaders all together. All together, they captured them. They killed them. Persecuted them. But guess what? The last Khalifa that they finished with was the Khalifa of Al-Abbas. 
because of the ghain. When he finished with them, the only country that left was Egypt. Long story short, who was the slave that made the dua to be freed so that he can serve Muslims? What was his name again? Huh, boys? Mention it three times so that y'all can capture. What was his name again? Yusuf, it's almost like you got it. What was his name? The name of the young boy. If I ask you right now, how many shots did LeBron and James take yesterday? Y'all gonna tell me right now. Stephen Curry, y'all been arguing. Stephen Curry and, uh, you know, LeBron, who the best and who the... Ain't giving you no dime, huh? His name was Kotos. I will ask you again. His name was? And I will ask you again. Kotos, long story short, was freed. He became a servant of the king. And the, the king passed away. The one who took the uh, leadership and rose to the throne, he became the closest one to him. Long story short, a slave turned into a king because he what? He dreamt of it yesterday and he had that dream and his dream was real. It was unlike that of Martin Luther King. He had real dream. He became a king. Hulaku wrote a letter to him. Do you know what Hulaku said in his letter? Hulaku was arrogant. Disobedient to God. He said, <laughs> like he the, he, the, he the milk of the whole world. That's what he said. Like, like he the one in charge of the world. فاتعذوا بغيركم وأسلموا إلينا أمركم نحن لا نرحم من بكى ولا نرق لمن شكى وقد سمعتم أن فتحنا البلاد وقتلنا معظم العبادة فاتعذوا بغيركم وأسلموا إلينا أمركم نحن لا نرحم من بكى ولا نرق لمن شكى قلوبنا كالجبال عددنا كالرمال الحصون لدينا لا تنفع ودعاؤكم علينا لا يسمع من حاربنا ندم ومن طلب الأمان سلم فلا تطين الخطاب وأسرع برد الجواب What type of arrogance is this? If you give this letter to a king of today he gonna melt If he disbelieve he gonna blow up He said from the king of all kings East to west Kotos, who is now in charge of Egypt, knows well that we are the representatives of God on earth, created from his wrath. And whosoever disobeys God, we are the punishment of God on him. You've heard that we've actually opened many, many places and we've killed your own people, Muslims all around. So they should be what? They should be a lesson for you. And do not be arrogant like some of them were. And guess what? Our number had outnumbered even the sand. Our heart is harder than what? Rot. In case you think y'all can pray against us, if you pray against us, God will not answer your prayer. And our sword is sharper than whatever you can imagine. Our horses faster than even the speed of light. All what we want from you, do not talk long and do not make your reply lengthy. Just be concise in your reply and just submit to us. If not, you are going to pay the price. When he used to write letters like this to the Muslim kings, they used to, you know, you see them sitting in the shed shivering just like a bird in the midst of rain. But when Qutuz read his letter, he said, who brought that letter? They said, 
40 عرجاً من عرج التتار You know, 40 strong men from Tatar. Where are they? He said, right there. He said, hang all of them. Hang all of them. First time in the history for a person to have even a heart to think that he will do some to a person, one single person among Tatar. Where did he hang all of them? He said, we're going to give them the lesson that they came with. In Ayn Jalut, they met in the battle called Ayn Jalut. And when they met in the battlefield called Ayn Jalut, you know what happened? That was on Friday and in the month of Ramadan. Check this out. Uh. Friday and in the month of Ramadan, when people eat suhoor, they go to sleep all the way to like closer to Dhuhr so they don't feel hungry. And some will go closer to even Salat al-Asr, and some will go right after Maghrib, pop up and jump. He says, it's Asr time yet? They already made Dhuhr and Asr. So they go brush their teeth and break their fast. They say, this is how to, you know, suppress Ramadan. Twist it up. In the month of Ramadan, in the land of Aini Jalut, on Jumu'ah, when Khutaba on the Manabir, he asked them to make Dua. When the battle started, what happened? The Tatar, the Mongols, all almost to defeat the Muslims. So from far, the king realized that, yo, you know what, that the things now, the dynamics changing now, and Muslims almost losing, so we have to take another what route to make dua or song. He jumped from the top of his horse, whatever they put on their heads to protect them in the battlefield, he, re he removed that. And he put it next to his own horse and he made sujood to Allah. And he said, oh Allah, I am only the king of this world. And people call me the king. But in reality, I'm not the king. You're the king of the kings. So the king of the world now is without power and is powerless. He's asking the most powerful to strengthen him against the enemy. That was the dua he made up. While in what? In the sujood. Taking dust. Putting on himself to show humility to who? To Allah. You think your president will leave his motorcade and make sujood like that? Or leave his Mercedes or leave his own Lamborghini and make sujood like that out of humility? Okay, when he made that dua, the whole scenario changed. It didn't take long. The victory was gained by Muslims. And that was the end of Tatar, who disturbed the world for years on the hand of a man who was once what? A slave. Do you know how long he ruled Egypt? Only 12 months. One year, he changed the Muslim, the way Muslims used to think, he changed that completely. The way Muslims used to fear, he removed that out in a year. You go somewhere, you start talking this talk, they're going to say, hey, you and your kutus, you better get out of here. They put you in their own small barzakh. That's what happened, huh? And since time is up, we cannot go further. But the few things that we will share with you, or we shared with you, just take it. Tatar, they met their end on the hands of a slave who was freed to save Muslims. So we sit in, don't overestimate yourself. Here is a Nu'man. The Persians all came together and they asked the pagans to help them out so that they can collide and take care of Muslims and wipe, annihilate Islam on the face of earth. All of them came together and they started concocting plots against Muslims and in order for them to disturb and cause a great deal of anxiety and among the beleaguered Muslims so that they can confuse them all, all together. That's what Furs did. At that time, Umar was the Khalifa. Umar gathered Muslims under the leadership of one man known as Nu'man. And you see Muslims coming on that day with their unity, with their form. When you see them coming, when the first saw Muslims coming behind one leader and one leadership, and they were coming, you look at them, 
In their heart, they were soft, but their faces ferocious, just like cheetah, tiger, and leopard all together coming with the Nile crocodile jaws. And if you meet them, nobody will be saved. And if you get in their jaws, you're in trouble. And you see them shooting, you see them from the top coming, just, they just like gun it. You see them penetrating the floor, they just like sidewinders, like rattlesnakes coming with their own sound, and people running away from them. That was their form and the unity that Muslims came with. Before they met the force in the battlefield, the leader made dua. He said, Oh Allah, before we meet them in the battlefield, I have two dua to make and one request. How many dua, boys? How many requests? Let's see. The first dua, Allahumma mansur dinak, O Allah, help your faith and help your religion, Islam. Wa aqirra aini bi nasrin, ya'izzu fihi ahlu ta'atik. And allow my eyes to be cooled down by seeing people being, you know, proud to worship and also to obey you by following the principles of the deen. So Allah help the deen and allow me to see the victory. That's the two dua that I get. And I have one request. Do you know that request? Someone's team mobile is ringing. Do you know that request, huh? He made two dua, one request. Oh Allah, help your deen. Oh Allah, cool on my eyes in order for me to see the deen flourishing and people proud of their faith. And my request is, and take me to you because I'm tired of the world. I don't want to go home. These people, sometimes you don't know what type of people they were. And that's what happened. Long story short, the deen was hell. Muslims gained the victory. And the first person to take shahada that day was Nu'man. When Umar heard that, he cried like a baby. Radiallahu anhum ajma'in. Nawashi ufi tuhri tawaya mawaisu. Mutayibatun agrasuhum wal magarisu. قلوبهم بيضة رواء من التقى تكاد تفقى والبطون خوامص محكمات الذكر قد أغنت عنهم عن قيل وقال You look at them, they're hungry, but when they come out with the ferociousness, you think like they, they, they finish eating the food of the world. Why? Because they get the love of the din in their hearts. But what we're doing today in San Diego, we're playing games, huh? Muslims in San Diego, I'm sorry, we're playing games. Are we united like that? And the one leadership? That when Muslims make a move, the whole Muslims in San Diego move? Is that how we get it set up? Is that how we get it set up? Maybe, maybe, but that's, maybe I don't know. Y'all fix it for me. Is that how we get it set up? You know, I don't mind. If y'all invite me again, it's not a big deal. Is that how we get it set up? When a Muslim one makes a van over there in Taif, you see another Muslim over there in Medina making iqama, and another one in Mecca is leading the prayer. That's how Muslims were together. And the one umbrella and the one banner moving with the deen, benefiting themselves and helping others. So as Muslims, if you are called a van here in San Diego, we like 3,000 miles all the way in Philadelphia. We're supposed to be able to even call a karma for your van and the Muslims down in Alabama to make the prayer. That's when the unity is unity. That's when we come together. And the what Surah Al Asr is teaching us what bil haqqi, what the sabr. See how Muslims are today, all across the world. Not only here in America, Muslims are supposed to make America great. But when we are sleeping now, our president, Mr. Trump, talking about I'm making America great again. As a Muslim, that's our responsibility. Huh? That's how Qutus did it. 
Not man did it. But are we in the battlefield? No. And Allah bless us, we're not in the battlefield. So that means if Allah had saved us from being in the battlefield and we're not in war with anyone, at least as Muslims, with what we got, we're supposed to even make a miracle for the world because the spirit of Islam is blown here in America. The spirit of the deen and the baton of Islam is right here in America. You think you can talk about the deen like this in all the Muslim countries that you all know? Can you do it? In America, the Constitution that allow us to do it, right or wrong? Then why we can't change the dynamics and make people, the destitute people, the best and feed the people and call them to the truth? Or if they cannot accept the deen, at least for them to understand what Islam is all about from us Muslims, not from media. From us Muslims, not from CNN. From us Muslims, not from Al Jazeera. From us Muslims, not from Al, Al, Al Arabiya channel. The privilege, you know, the constitution had given us the platform to call, practice, and perform our deed. Look at the way we're sitting here in some Muslim world. Can you gather like this and talk freely? Come on with your freestyle. You're going to be in the highway by tomorrow. So if Allah had given us this, and the baton is here, and Allah had given us the, the, the power, and he had given us the way to promote, talk about, Invite Muslims are we supposed to make the place in America the most peaceful spot for the whole world. Now, when it comes to you know people outside, we, we were in the Middle East in Ramadan. That's Ramadan in the Middle East. Huh? Do you know what happened? We were we, we went to pray Salat al Maghrib, finished breaking our fast. It's a, a Muslim land. Huh? We, on our way to pray Maghrib, we saw the biggest masjid in the whole, you know, spot going to pray. Before entering the masjid, you know what was written in front of the masjid on the mihrab from outside? You have no idea. You get no idea. You know what I was reading? On the mihrab from outside, they wrote Tupac. The young boys, that's what they're into. Hey, what's up? Did you hear this new thing that two, two, two pack and three pack hooked together? Did, did you, you know, have you seen the new thing that 50 cent or 75 cent did? You see some that Bob, you know, you know, dropped just long, not long ago. So we try and promote the deal, they somewhere doing something else. And I'm not giving it to us here. And the spirit is here. And Islam and Muslims see what Muslims did from the beginning, even during the revolution here in America. I don't know whether you've read the letter that the first president of our nation, the first president, George Washington, have you read the, the letter he wrote to the king of, uh, what do you call it, Morocco? I can see the way he addressed him. You know, on the first, the December, you know, first, in 1787, I believe it was, he wrote him a letter. See the way he talked to him. And the way he, you know, thanked him. And Muslims all together for their commitment and for the help that they gave the country. That's ever since. Have you heard of this? Have you heard of Mormonism? The Mormons and their own faith? Have you heard of this faith before? Mormonism. The Mormons. Do you know how many Mormons in the world? The whole Mormons in the world, not more than 50 million. In the whole world. And Mormonism is not even the world religion. It's all in America, in Mexico, in Peru, in where, Argentina, in Chile, and in Brazil. So are the only places where you can find Mormons, huh? 
But guess what? The state next to Colorado, the state next to Nevada, in between the two is what? Utah. Have you heard of the state of Utah? Yes. Y'all know Utah, right? The 45th state of this union? Utah. Do you know Utah? The moments they captured the whole Utah, ain't no governor would accept this from them. No governor accept this from what? From them. The hospitals belongs to them. The schools belongs to them. Nobody will get or even gain an office without their what? Their approval. And there are only 50 million around the world. And the faith is not even what? It's not worldwide. It's not on the worldwide platform. And Muslims have been here before the moments. Now tell me what state we got. A Muslim get a little mass shit. We think like we the super. We got little organization, you know, little bigger. It's a law walk, but we the biggest. And y'all, the, the small, small one, y'all need to shut the, yours down because we the big. They captured state. It's sitting town like some corners. They get the hospitals. And we still even struggling to open a little, little like, like maybe just a little like restaurant with halal. Muslims have been asking whether we can eat from McDonald's or we cannot eat from McDonald's. Taco Bell, you know, Wendy's. Can we eat, can we eat Wendy's when the wind is blowing? Shit, can we eat from Taco Bell even we don't agree with their bells? Shit, can we eat even from McDonald's even we don't agree with the M? Muslims have been asking this for more than 20 years in America, and they're still asking. And a person will sit in the mess and asking the shit, shit, can we eat from McDonald's? As he's asking, his daughter or his son is filling an application to work in McDonald's. Do you know why we kept on asking? Because we cannot even come up with a good restaurant that, that's supposed to be even, not, even if it's not nationwide, but where we are is the biggest restaurant that we know this is pure, have that everybody can come. And when you get in, when it comes to the service, it's A1. Sometimes you open a restaurant, you know, you go to the even kitchen. Stop for a line now, even coming here again. <laughs> Sometimes the setup, the food is good, but it doesn't look good inside. See McDonald's, they're serving the worst food, but service-wise, they get it tight. Right or wrong, Shake? Right or wrong, Shake? Shake, that's, not, that's McDonald's. And we've been here sitting arguing. Do you know McDonald's is all around the world? We have, they have McDonald's even in front of Haram. They have McDonald's even in Medina. Have McDonald's even in Mecca. Muslims, we don't have good food. Each and every country gets some nice food. See the Moroccan brothers, I got couscous. We don't have, we cannot couscousize restaurant with it. Muslims got good food. Arabs, good food. See the Somali food? With Anjara and Basbusa that y'all get? But we can come up with some. But Muslims, see, Allah giving us all these. To add values. If we cannot change the situation of poverty in America, see all what people do? We raise money and send it to this country. Raise money and send it to that country. Raise money and send it here. All of this is good and it's virtuous act. And it's also rewardable to raise and help some people from outside where they need help. But we need to start here first. We don't have poor, there's two people in America, we don't? Check, we don't? We don't have poor people in America here? The young boys you see in the street, why are they stealing? Why are they busting people's houses? Because they need some. And because, see, unless just, you get extra money, extra wealth, and you don't share with the young boys in the street? Okay, the money that you're supposed to give them that you don't give it, you're going to give it to home security. You understand what I'm talking about, Shay? You're going to put some security. 
you know, system in your house. Why are you putting security system in your house? What for? Why? No reason? Scrub them, them young boys, huh? You give them the wealth, give them the money, you no know, need. Even they're going to be the vanguards for you. They're going to protect the houses for you. So Muslims and brothers and sisters in faith are not giving us all these. It's just that we have to utilize all that. And make sure we focus where we are. And see, if you have a device and you want to use GPS in it, and the location is turned off, will you be able to use that GPS? Will you be able? The device, you get internet and all, and it's functioning well, but the location is turned off. If you punch in your address, will you get from point A to point B? Why? Why is that? Because the location is what? That's Muslims right there. Our location is off. We in America, but we're still thinking from outside or thinking where we came from. I want to build here. I want to do this in this country. I want to do it in that country. I want to do it in this country. And we're thinking about places that we will not even, even go maybe in 20, 30 years. And a person will be sitting in America. He has three, four houses in his own country that he never even lived in. And all the time when we talk, what can we do here? What can we do for this country? All this good. But when it comes to inside, internally, what did we do? Hakidis, young boys, you think they will grow up and you say, you know, you know, my son, Yusuf, guess what? I love you, boy. I was born here. Just go and live there forever. You think Yusuf is going to just go? If he goes out of respect for his dad, the moment his dad is out, he's going to say, alhamdulillah, I'm going back. <laughs> Okay, that's, that's the reality, huh? I'm sorry, I'm not cooking it for you well tonight. And I'm sorry if I'm giving it to you raw like this. But see, when you go to the hospital, the doctor doesn't care about how you feel. He cares about what? He cares about what? Whatever illness that you have, the treatment of it is what he what? He cares about. If you tell doctor, you know, oh, that's too much for me, you know, I'm feeling pain, just leave it alone. Will you be healed? So I'm sorry, brothers, and I'm sorry, sisters, if I'm dropping it raw like this, you know, tonight. But, you know, that's how it is. And that's the, the disease that we have. And we, we've been hearing the talk and, you know, the problems and all that. But who walking for the cure? We cannot diagnose problems and disease and always, you know, prognosis, diagnosis, and all the noses, noses turning into nose, but no cure. No, we have to change that. We have to switch it. And the young boys, if the X generation and the baby boomers can't do it, that's your turn. Because you'll get the location here. So this is how it's supposed to. We cannot change the whole thing. Poverty, you know, the fear. At least, at least we add value to whatsoever America has to offer. Not everything the government will do. And don't sit for somebody to come and do it. You do it for your community. Do it for your city. Do it. Social service. That's how Prophet Sallallahu started the movement with, Jay. He used to serve people. When Quraysh disputed over who will take the black, you know, stone and place it in Kaaba, who solved the problem for them? Who? The Prophet Sallallahu Akbar. See? Smart boy right there. He solved the problem. He came out and he saw them disputing. What are you disputing for? They said because each tribe wants to get the sharaf wadi hajar al aswad in the makani or fi makani. They said, okay, this tribe wants to place it, this tribe wants to place it, this tribe. They started arguing. They said, okay, let's agree. Whoever will come from this door, who will muhakkamu fina? He will be the what? The arbiter. To arbitrate. As they were sitting and waiting, who will pop up? 
guess who popped up? That was our Prophet Sallallahu he came out. At that time, he was only 35. How old? Was he a prophet at that time? No. But when he popped up, do you know what they said? They said, Radina bil Amin. All of them, all together, they said, we trust an Amin to arbitrate, and Muhammad should arbitrate, and all of them surrounded. They said, he is the most trustworthy. Let him arbitrate. MashaAllah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. See? That's my man over there. He disappeared for years. You know, he, he turned Noriega on me. You know, he turned Noriega. Welcome, man. You see? <laughs> you see? This, this is what happened. They said the one that will pop up, he will be the one? The arbiter. He arbitrated among them, and all of them get it straight. But guess what? We're the Muslims today. Are we the arbiters? We're the Muslim boys and the Muslim young boys and the young girls. Where the Muslims at? Are we the arbiters? The shot being called on us. You go in, in, in the courtroom, will you see a Muslim sitting over there you, like the judge? No, always sitting on the bench, you know, in the shock waiting to go to jail. When we talk about Sunnah brothers, when we talk about Sunnah sisters, we, we, the, the, the Sunnah is not one way. Sunnah is not one way. Sunnah is like boulevard, huh? It's wide open. Nobody was able to influence Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or to gain upper hand. And he wasn't sitting all the time, and he wasn't sitting, he just begging. Or he wasn't sitting waiting for somebody to do something for him. Socially, he was engaged. This sunnah, is that the sunnah we're practicing today? When we say sunnah, all people, what people think about, they think like sunnah, you know, how to pray good, how to make sure you get your aqidah tight, and what you wear, and how you talk, that's all sunnah. I keep people coming to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and asking, O oh Prophet, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we are here for you, even though we're not Muslims, but we're seeking your judgment, because we know you what? You're trustworthy. One of them, like Abu Sufyan, will say, my number one enemy was Muhammad. He kept on giving me camels and providing for me and providing for me and providing for me and providing for him until he became the most beloved one to my heart. Shayba ibn Uthman, he said, my number one enemy was Muhammad and all what I've been dreaming about is to kill him until I met him in the battlefield. When I raised the sword to chop his neck, he turned. When he turned, my sword dropped. Because I saw his face just like a lion in the battlefield. He took the sword. Instead of chopping my neck, he placed his hand on my chest and he made dua for me. Allahumma a'idhu min shaytan Oh Allah, save him from devil. He said that dua that he made and his hand that he placed on my chest became so cool in my heart. is just like the best thing in my life ever. And from that moment, I loved him more than even my own parents. If I had seen someone who was trying to harm him, if even if my father is in front of him trying to harm him, I will be the one. Okay, time is up. We'll see you next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.